Welcome into the KSO Show. Mason Voth, Derek Young here with you as we get set for the fourth show of the week, D.Y. There are no football games. There have been no basketball games yet, yet we are uh, in show number four. Feels like all I've done is spend time in my basement this week recording because Drew and I also knocked out a handful of uh, football commit videos, So, which is never a bad thing uh, when K-State's rolling in commitments on the football side. So uh, not, a, not a complaint there. And now we get ready for actual games again the stuff that people really get excited about what everybody looks forward to we're going to get to see the k-state basketball team back on the floor after an eight-day hiatus they most recently took down lsu on the road in baton rouge you were there for that one got to see how the cats were playing and now they return home to face former big 12 big eight foe nebraska a team that they've played the last two seasons k-state has beat nebraska both times uh, last year's game in kansas city that kind of felt like the jumping off point for the season where it felt like this team started to turn a corner and go from, okay, drum tang has made this not be a crap basketball team, but they actually feel like they might have some good things going for them because they showed up and pretty much handled business with an okay Nebraska team. Uh, basically the entire way. It was an awesome crowd at T-Mobile center. And now you get the return trip finally on campus with Nebraska um, we'll, we'll just start there. What do you expect from K-State and Nebraska this weekend in terms of how the game plays out and if it's as easy for K-State as it has been the last two seasons? I don't think it'll be as easy. I think you're talking about a pretty competitive game for the most part, I would suggest. Um, you never know. I mean, Nebraska has hung with some solid teams, beat some teams you thought might be solid but probably aren't. Um, and then got blasted at home by a pretty good team in Creighton, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, you could probably chalk that one up to maybe Creighton had a really good night at the same time that Nebraska played one of the poorest games of the year. College of basketball, I keep saying this sometimes, is especially at this time of year, is still pretty volatile. Like if, if a really good team plays really good and a solid team plays really bad, it can be a 30-point win. So uh, we'll see what happens. I think Kansas State is – they're, they're off an eight game hiatus, as you said. Uh, Nebraska is also at seven. So th they played last Sunday. So mm -hmm. there's not like an advantage to be had there. One team more fresh than the other, or one more sluggish and, you know, a little bit cold to start just because of the, the long layoff. I, I don't think there's an advantage to be had. If there is, it might be the home team. So that would favor Kansas State in all actuality. So They'll be interested where they go from here. Uh, the Huskers have kind of hung around a little bit, um, but and and I think they're a better team this year. So that's what's going to be interesting. But like I said, I think Kansas State's also coming off probably their two most impressive wins of the season. Yeah, well, and, and you look at Nebraska and what they've done coming in. They had the back-to-back -back losses. The Creighton one. Creighton's a good team, but we also just saw them lose the UNLV. And so to lose at home by almost 30 points, that's not necessarily excusable no matter how good the opponent is. Uh, and then they lost at Minnesota. Minnesota's not very good. Um, and then they turn around and credit to them for bouncing back. Like Michigan State still has talent, even though I think Tom Izzo's a fraud. And I don't think Michigan State's very good this year. And I laugh at the you know the preseason top ten that they got slapped with because what they were a Sweet Sixteen team last year like ah, I don't get that one but um, for them to bounce back that's still significant and Nebraska has players honestly maybe this isn't fair because maybe they're not this bad but you know you don't see them in the postseason they don't do a lot Nebraska basketball right now is kind of like KU football before Lance Leipold got there where Number one, it's a, a school that is traditionally not a basketball school. KU traditionally not a football school. You're in the shadows of massive nationally recognized programs with Nebraska football and KU basketball. Again, given KU basketball actually comes through and is good at being a national recognizable brand. Nebraska football, not really. But then you look at the, the roster construction – Individual player-wise, Nebraska has had some guys that can play and that can definitely hurt you, like most teams can. But, I mean, this team has four guys averaging double figures. They have three guys that are averaging all at 14 points per game. Like, 
you can get bitten by this. And that's kind of how I viewed those KU teams uh, prior to Lance Leipold taking over is if you looked at them, they had individual talent in some spots. They could, that's why they were able to beat Texas at one point, or they were able to sneak up and beat, you know, I think TCU a couple times. Like they had the talent that if you weren't locked in and ready, they can do something to you. But this still, I don't think is a very good Nebraska team, uh, even though they are improving and K-State being at home, this should be an opportunity for them to, similar with what they did against LSU, come out, play a full 40 minutes, and have this game at an arm's length the entire way. And uh, when you look up at the end of the day on the scoreboard, you know K-State's got a 10- to 15-point win. That's kind of how I would expect this game to play out. Yeah, I was going to say, I, I guess arm's length uh, is probably in the eye of the beholder. I expect it to be pretty competitive throughout, and then Kansas State pulls away in the final five to eight minutes. Yeah, I mean, I think if it's a if K State's got a six to seven point lead throughout the entire game, and then you know at the end they stretch it into double digits, that that's probably that price suffice enough for me. I I'm not asking a ton in these non conference games. Like all I ask of you is not to go to overtime with crappy Oral Roberts and North Alabama teams and just to win every other game that's left on the schedule right now. And as long as they do that, they can. Plus, Nebraska's a better team than North Alabama and Oral Roberts. And I will concede that I think the product all around in college basketball this year is probably lesser than. And so uh, we've seen other teams drop some nasty games this week. Um, I mean, Marquette about did it last night to St. Thomas, and obviously we know Creighton lost at UNLV the other night. So I, maybe I should be give K-State a little retroactive leeway for those overtime games. I still don't think it was good. I'm still good with what I said after those games. Uh, but they've clearly bounced back, and they're playing better basketball right now. The pre-Christmas games are tricky for sure. They showed that to be the case every single season with some of those upsets that we typically see even from good teams. What I will say is nah, I don't – know that I would say it's a certainty that Oral Roberts is worse than Nebraska. Oral Roberts got off to a poor start this year for whatever reason when they lost to UT Arlington and Missouri State. Since then, um, they beat a couple solid teams according to the the metrics. And, and, in, and in addition to Kansas State defeating them by 10 in overtime, they hung with A&M, who I think is solid, and they almost beat Texas Tech yeah. the other night. So well, I would say – there's, they're at least even, I would say, Oral Roberts in Nebraska. Here's a, here's the question. Are, would you be brave enough on Sunday to, to put a little something on Oral Roberts winning at Oklahoma State? Because Yeah, I think I, so. I, I, I mean, think Oklahoma I would State, be. Oklahoma State's lost to – Southern Illinois. Yeah, Oklahoma State's – I think against these, let's say, non-high major teams – call them the buy games or just mm -hmm. all the mid-majors that Oklahoma State's play. I think they have yes. a losing record against their – against the uh, – they might. Uh, yeah. Well, I think I think they're four and three now. Uh, so they have losses to Abilene Christian, St. Bonaventure, and Southern Illinois, but they do have wins over Tulsa, Houston Christian, New Orleans, and Sam Houston State. So they are four and three now. Uh, but – it's they're they're not playing good basketball by any means. And what's crazy, I was looking at it last night, uh, and we'll get back to K State Nebraska here in a second. But I was looking at it last night just to kind of uh, you know do oh, our Big Twelve power, power rankings. And Oklahoma State, they're not like the stereotypical. Oh, their offense sucks this year. Like I had I had written in there already where I was like, you know, this you know, Oklahoma State bad on offense. And then I was like, I better go double check that because I feel like that but I've really only watched them against Southern Illinois I go in there and look they're shooting like 36 percent from three this season and they're scoring in the 90s in games like this Oklahoma State team sucks and they're finally playing offense so uh this is just a bad basketball team and, and Mike Boynton is probably going to be gone after this year so I I probably will put something on Oral Roberts to win this weekend in Stillwater <laughs> excuse me to be fair the teams that they've scored 90 on are New Orleans and Houston Christian. <laughs> yes, that is true. Uh, that is very true. In those other games, they've scored 71, 74, 69, 66, 65, 78, 79. They didn't yeah, – how about 110 uh, – yeah, I don't know. I, it's kind of crazy. I guess I was looking at Oral Roberts there. Sorry. I was going – I was like, Ozark Christian. Why would Oklahoma State play Ozark Qu Christian yeah, if that was not I guess, Yeah, I guess 
I guess my initial point was like I don't I don't know if it's a slam dunk that Nebraska is better than Oral Roberts. I think Oral Roberts yeah. is a solid mid major. Nebraska is a below average high major. Yeah, and well, I mean on the high end, you might look and see that. Um, I, you may say that you like Isaac McBride better than anybody that Nebraska has, and certainly I think style of play wise, when you have a a mid major team like that and they have one guy that is clearly their go to, that can make it a little bit tougher to defend. Nebraska, it's you know guys trying to settle in and share the ball and the role out there. Um, so it'll be kind of interesting to to follow and and see how it plays out. I will say. The number one thing in, in games with Nebraska, at least that are important to me uh, and, and what I think K-State needs to do, you've got to find a way to just make sure that you you stop K-State Tamananga, uh, who's going to go and try and find a spot to just spot up and launch threes. Look, I love watching him play uh, my kind of basketball, but you can get burnt by it if you're K-State. And so that's honestly probably the most concerning thing here because – Barring Nebraska shooting the ball incredibly well, I just don't think Nebraska can win a game in Bramlage Coliseum against K-State the way they're playing right now. Yeah, the, the three ball you talked about there, that's its always something that can be the, the equalizer if you let somebody get hot. Yeah. Uh, with K-State on, on Sunday, what do you expect from them to come out and, you know, long layoffs can be tricky – you obviously already mentioned that this time of year, the the pre-holiday games can be a struggle. Um, how do you expect them to play? And and more so, what do you expect the the flow and the offense to look like from them? Because, look, K-State's got three guys averaging 16 points per game right now and Cam Carter, Tyler Perry, and Arthur Kaluma. But it feels like Arthur Kaluma is starting to, to grab the, the mantle of being the number one on the roster. Are we going to get more like go with the flow, see whose game it is, or are we getting close to a point where K-State's going to try and get Arthur Kaluma going earlier than everybody else? No, I think when you got three guys, you kind of let that work itself through, and whoever takes that mantle takes that mantle. I don't, Especially with the way they played against Villanova and LSU, right? Uh, unless that's what they did in those games. I don't think it was. I think you kind of ride with that winning formula, with that winning yeah. recipe. Don't really – um, mess with success all that much um, kind of feel it out who's got it going on who doesn't um, you said we had three they got three guys averaging mm-hmm. at least 16 points per game that feels like that's only going to increase not not that it's going to be more than three guys but I think Tyler Perry I would think is only going to get more comfortable especially more efficient from three at some point yeah. and his points per game are going to rise Arthur Columas will probably rise, assuming that he continues this, you know, bout of great play, which has been, I'm being at this point, five or six games, just because I think he's still making up for the slow start that he had to begin the season. And then Cam Carter's probably been the most consistent of the three in terms of points production. Um, even though if it's like Tyler Perry sometimes, where it's like I have one great half and then the other half I'm doing something else. So uh I, I wouldn't surprise me if the, at the end of the season you're talking about maybe 17, 18 points per game for those three, um, all three of them. But I, I don't really try to force the issue. I guess the only thing I would say, it would be nice to see a Tyler Perry game where he's like, what we, not what we expected, because this is probably um, an inverse of what we've kind of seen, but a game or two here where he, used, where he goes five or six yeah. from like eight or nine from three. Yeah, like, honestly, the game he had against South Dakota State was good because it kind of quelled everybody's, uh, I guess, they were a little on edge about him because he went out in that game against South Dakota State, was 7 of 9 from the field, 6 of 8 from 3, had 22 points. And really, if you go and look since that point, the best percentage that Tyler Perry has shot in a game from 3 is 33% against Oral Roberts when he was 4 of 12 from deep. So, I, I, I get what you're saying here, and I think it's just you won a game from Tyler Perry where it's efficient and it's good from the jump. It's not, hey, we're, you know, 0 of 7 in the first half, but then we kind of bounce back and, you know, it's 3 of 6 from 3 in the second. Like, I, I get where you're coming from. I think that would just be important for probably not just the fan base being a little bit calmer about the basketball situation, but it would be good for Tyler Perry and for this team to see because – and, and fan has talked about it a lot, but a lot of the Tyler Perry struggles right now probably are just 
chalked up to confidence and making sure that there's a comfort and excitement. And I think he's been thinking too much, and I think that's why he's been so good late in these games where they need a big shot. There's no time to think there. You have to get what you want and shoot it when it's there. And I think too many times right now he's still waffling back and forth between should I shoot this or should I not? Let it fly. Like Jerome Tang just had Marquise Noel on his team last year. He can handle a guy taking some bad shots every once in a while if you have the ability to knock him down, and Tyler Perry certainly does. Yeah, it's like I like what you said. If he gets like those two games I'm talking about in a row, then the ball starts really rolling. And when you feel good about yourself, you play good, you play better. Um, and on the and you know in a, in addition to that, just because of how good he has been from three, Arthur Kaluma, don't turn down an open three. Yeah, I agree with that. Arthur Kaluma is the best three-point shooter on K-State's roster right now. Um, And then after that, it's a pretty significant drop-off in terms of three-point shooting, uh, especially for guys that are getting like major minutes because R.J. Jones is shooting 38.5%, but that's not a major minute guy. So it goes down to Tyler Perry, who's 32%. um, Or, yeah, 32%. Cam Carter's at 314 um, Day Day Ames is probably a guy that you would like to see the, the three point shooting improved. He's at 28 and a half right now. And if he's going to be on the floor as much as he is, you need him to be able to, to let it fly when he's open and when it's in the flow of the offense to keep things going and keep defenses honest. So, honestly, and this should be no surprise to anybody, I obviously I think three pointers are the way to go in basketball. Um, but K State, that's probably the biggest thing they need to improve upon right now is just becoming a better three-point shooting team, which is tough to do. Like, so much of shooting is just natural ability. But this team is not shooting to what their level could and should be, and I think they can improve upon that. No, because those numbers should improve from Perry and Carter, and Kaluma's only rising. So I I agree. Although what I will say, even scouting Data Ains as a prospect um, and what he has shown to be, not that he can't – people get better at shooting, um, no doubt about it, and – uh, gradual improvement will have him as a pretty good shooter, maybe you know, in a, yeah. in a year or two. But he was never really an outside shooter, even as a high school prospect. He's more slasher, getting to the lane. Uh, he does love the mid range, which <laughs> you're going to have to live and die with. But he's got to make more of them if, if that's going yeah. to be what he does. Yeah, yeah, that's that's true. Uh, I can if fans somewhere screaming right now that he's got to be better about that because. Day Day is also shooting under thirty percent from the field right now, so it's not a it's not a great start to to things for him. All right, uh, before we get out of here, uh, who are you taking on Sat- Sunday? K State, I'm sure. What what number do you think they win by? I'll say K State by nine. Like I, I like I said, I think it's gonna be competitive throughout, and then they pull away a little bit late. But you never know how the the free throw stuff goes, how late stuff goes. Um, things might be a little clunkier than they were against LSU and Villanova just because you got the layoff. You got Christmas coming up. Um, there hasn't been zero distractions, but there's been less distractions. Yeah. I, Nebraska's probably wants to play up for this game. They see Kansas State across the chest, and um, you know, they're not going to play a terrible game, which you would have thought that, that when they saw Creighton across the chest, too. I get, I, yeah. I, I, I say K State by about nine. All right, I'm going to take the Cats by 12. That feels like uh, the right number to me, so that's where I'm going to go. Uh, Real quick, a basketball edition of Big 12 scoreboard. Uh, Take a look around some really big games in college basketball this weekend, but the Big 12 is a key player in a lot of them. Uh, The league won't play any games tonight as everybody kind of is settling down from their finals week stuff, but it gets started uh, on Saturday. Texas is going to face LSU at 11 a.m., KU's on the road in Bloomington. Baylor is in Detroit to face Michigan State. Houston will face Texas A&M. West Virginia against Frank Martin and UMass up in Springfield. And uh, Dayton and Cincinnati, Vanderbilt, Texas Tech, Green Bay OU, Georgia State, BYU, and Arizona State TCU. So a lot of games on Saturday. Uh, Of those Saturday games, which ones are you most looking forward to? Yeah, I, I can't say I've really dug into basketball too much yet so I, I, what do you got because you probably looked at those games more than i have well point. so here's uh here's what i would say um i am probably looking honestly i'm looking most forward to baylor and michigan state i would like baylor to prove me right i think baylor 
is I think Baylor is playing like the best team in the Big 12 right now, but I have them as the second best team in the Big 12 behind Kansas. And I would like to see Baylor just go out there and do nasty things to Michigan State and Tom Izzo and continue to make him look terrible. Um, but that's a big game. Like you're on the, it's a neutral site game, but you're in Michigan. So it's going to be pretty heavy Michigan State flair. Um, that's a significant game just to kind of go out and prove yourself. So that's probably the game on Saturday that I'm most looking forward to. I would also I say whatever the line ends up being, KU minus that against Indiana, because I think Indiana sucks. And KU's done a pretty good job in these games against Indiana of taking care of business. So that's what I'll throw out there. I, I would agree on the Baylor thing. I got these games put up now. In, um, yeah, I would agree on Baylor taking care of business. You, you want to see that. I might hesitate on your KU prognostication, not just not no. Look, I'm, I look. I hate this KU team right now. I don't think I don't think they're very yeah, good, just, but, but I just but, think Indiana is that bad. Yeah, but t- road teams rarely cover at Assembly Hall. That's all. That's yeah. all I will say. So that that's how I feel. You know, and this is mainly probably from a Kansas State perspective. No other games really grab my attention. <laughs> well, before I get to the one that I'll like really be focused on from a Kansas State perspective. See what Houston does against Texas A&M will be intriguing just because I did most of my Big 12 power rankings based on resume because I hadn't hadn't seen a lot of these teams play. So it's like, who have you beat? Who have you lost to? Stuff like that. And Houston, um, they haven't really scheduled up to the point where they've been challenged. And Texas A&M's a little bit sloppier than people would thought they'd be, but they were a preseason top 25 team. So seeing Houston against the team of talent, I think that's going to be probably something I keep an eye on. Cincinnati's off to a really good start. Um, also haven't really played a whole lot of teams. I think their best win is against Georgia Tech. Yeah. Um, so seeing what they do against Dayton, who I believe has already beaten a couple good teams. I will, I will give Cincinnati credit, though. Um, I don't know what my screen's doing. Did I give a thumbs up or something that just flashed up there how that happened? Um. I'll give Cincinnati credit because I watched obviously a handful of Cincinnati basketball in the American being down here in Wichita. Oh, what, what, am I, what keep, why does a thumbs up keep flashing up on my screen? Uh, Someone likes it. What is going on? I have no idea what is happening, but okay, whatever. Um, so basically Cincinnati has been pretty crappy the last three years. The first year they had John Brandon, who had been the Northern Kentucky coach. He got canned after a year. I think there were some allegations of like player abuse. And so they brought in Wes Miller. And I I really like Wes Miller, like high energy guy, young, is probably a pretty good coach, but they've struggled the last two years. They feel like more of the real deal this season. Their only problem is going to be that they're playing a big 12 schedule, which I'm not saying they can't overcome that. It just feels like right now that this is probably a team that isn't quite ready to compete in the Big 12, but I think they'll do fine the non-con. So I will give credit to Cincinnati, even if the schedule hasn't been, you know, the toughest of tests. And I mean, another team that I'll throw out there, they play on Sunday. TJ Otzelberger loves scheduling like Sunday afternoon games. I know RIP Alec Bussey, it pisses him off to no end that he has to go cover a bunch of these late Sunday games against you know, Ken Palm 300 teams, they play Florida A&M. That guy has to start scheduling tougher. Like, you're in the Big 12, dude. Have some respect for yourself and go out there and actually challenge your team because what he does is he leaves Iowa State with a little, like, margin for error in the Big 12 play, which they've gotten the benefit of the doubt. They get to go, like, 7-11 and 11 in conference play the last two years and go into the tournament. But uh, I think Iowa State, they've got some guys that concern me. Um, they've got a like a, a taller kid that just knocks down threes at a high level right now, but I don't think Iowa State is as good as the record indicates. Um, and I about ripped my hair out watching the field of 68 last night. They're talking about like second tier sleeper teams in the Big 12, and it was like Oklahoma, um, BYU, and then Iowa State. I'm like, no, 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 Iowa State is not in the same category as Oklahoma and BYU, even though I think all three teams might ultimately end up not being like world beaters Iowa State has not done anything this year to deserve to be in the same category of BYU and Oklahoma who at least have some impressive wins and like records on their resume not the case for Iowa State so I don't get the Iowa State love so I'm looking for they'll they'll beat Florida A&M but I'm looking forward to seeing how they kind of continue to play and then 
we already mentioned Oral Roberts in Oklahoma State. I'll, I'll probably have a pretty hefty eye on that one because I do think uh, Oral Roberts might be able to get the job done. They've been so close in other games against high major teams this year. Yeah, it's funny. I almost overlooked that one. So that one's interesting to me, Oral Roberts, Oklahoma State, uh, for reasons that we've already shared. I think we'll learn a lot about Cincinnati because I think Dayton is solid. And I guess because Texas hasn't been great this year. Well, very inconsistent. They're mm-hmm. – Almost a little bit like Kansas State now. Yeah. Where they're Texas basketball. almost lost to Louisville. Yeah, they beat Louisville by one. Their they're really good basketball has been really good. And their bad basketball has been pretty bad. Kind of like Kansas State. But Kansas mm-hmm. State just is on the heels of their best. Texas is not. So what Texas does at home against LSU, not that the transitive property matters, but it'll be good to apply that perspective for Kansas State right now because maybe it tells us more of where LSU is. Yeah, I think that's a good call. Um, I shouldn't have overlooked that game because Texas has been up and down. The one guy though, Max Acemus has has come through. Uh, honestly, if you're if you're K State and you look around at guys that there was some interest in in the transfer portal that are now playing in the Big Twelve, like it's not fun to see because Max Acemus is averaging 17 a game, shooting at 40 percent from deep. Ray J. Dennis has been, if not Baylor's best player, their second best player. And then LJ Cryer is the leading scorer for Houston right now. Um, it's kind of tough to look around because, look, I, I'm I'm fine with Tyler Perry. He's got to play better, though, um, as we get closer to conference play for K-State because he just isn't even coming close to being what those other three guys have been for their schools right now. And going into it all, I thought Tyler Perry was going to be of the caliber of those guys and be able to put up numbers and be helpful to K-State. He's still you know what I, is, I think I keep getting the thumbs up because I'm holding Elliot like this. So apologies to anybody that think I'm Steve proming it and being Mr. Dad at the podium after a <laughs> loss and bringing my kid up there for sympathy. Uh, this is the only way we're going to finish this thing because she started to freak out. So uh, sorry about that. Uh, unprofessional of me, I'm sure. <laughs> I wouldn't even extend that to Aaron Estrada. You remember him? And he picked Alabama yeah. over to state. Yep. He leads Alabama and steals. He's their second leading scorer at 15 points per game, and he's shooting 43% from three. Yeah, no, that's a good call. Uh, I would like, I, w- I wouldn't mind having Aaron Estrada right now. And honestly, like Alabama has a tough stretch coming up. They play Creighton uh, on Saturday, and then they play Arizona next week. Like, there's a chance that Alabama is six and five at one point. Uh, maybe Aaron Estrada can be one of those guys at the end of the year that's texting Jerome Tang and saying he wishes he would have come to K State. I forgot the member Mo Wagi, uh, yes. the, the transfer from is it West Virginia? Yep, yep. Yeah. Uh, he picked Alabama over after already at least silently committing to yeah. Kansas State. He's averaging just about 13 minutes a game, so not a high usage player, but. Uh, he is shooting 70% from the field and averaging six and four. Oh. So. <laughs> Another one to twist the knife, Joe Toussaint, also a uh, West oh, Virginia Mountaineer. Good. He is the leading scorer for Texas Tech right now and having probably the best season of his career. So uh, <laughs> the transfer portal market, look, K-State was in on some guys. They thought they, they had were, some of them. They were chasing they got the right hard. ones. They were yeah. chasing the right ones. <laughs> yeah, they were. They were sniffing around the right spot. They just weren't able to to close ultimately, and that's. And they still did well. Yeah. I mean, you got to think, Will. Yeah. Even the late ones, Will McNair has been really solid, um, and obviously Tyler Perry and Arthur Kluma are two of your three best players. Cam Carter was a transfer portal guy just a year. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't know. We'll see uh, how it works out for K State. I still think there's time for Tyler Perry to turn it around, and yeah. uh, but he'll be compared to those guys throughout the year because that was important and K-State's going to have to come to grips with some of the same stuff that Bruce Weber talked about. And I know that we don't want to compare Jerome Tang and Bruce Weber with each other because they're not the same, but Bruce Weber talked about like, yeah, you know, that elite eight run, it got us in different kids living rooms, but we weren't ever going to be able to close it with those guys. Look, Jerome Tang and the staff, I know it's only been basically two cycles and Keontae Johnson came through, but the deep run and the excitement, it can get you right there in the mix for these guys. At some point, you got to start closing it or striking earlier on other dudes because it, I know that you're not going to hit on everybody. It is unfortunate the amount of misses and time that K-State put into everything and seeing how good they're playing elsewhere and the fact that Tyler Perry, who, again, I, I still like, still expect big things from, is basically struggling to start this season. Yeah, 
<laughs> yeah, but he's got the two major shots, two major plays off yeah, the ball. That's true. Still averaging 16 points per game. You beat him. You beat SEC schools for him as well, right? Yeah, I mean, Alabama that's and true. Auburn in those schools. And on top of that, you beat Kentucky and Alabama for Arthur Kaluma. So, yeah. Yeah. It just no, seems you, like a normal, normal hit rate. Yeah, me. that's true. And I, I should think more highly of Kaluma because there are teams that didn't get Kaluma that I'm sure right now are going, man, if we had just gotten him. Because, like, Arthur Kaluma currently is having the best season of his career. So I, I shouldn't be too negative about that. Too much glass half empty for me. But, all right, that will do it for us on this edition of the KSO Show. Thank you for watching and listening wherever you were doing it. Make sure you get over to K-State online for all of your info that you want, need on K-State football and basketball. Signing day is less than a week away. Chris Kleiman will do that. Actually, uh, you'll probably have heard this when they'll have already spoken, but Chris Kleiman and Jerome Tang both have press conferences on this Friday, so you will get to hear from both of those guys uh, and then plenty of other stuff going on over there. So get over to kstateonline.com with On3. Get signed up if you're not. It'll be a good time. Great community of K-Staters to talk to about whatever. Voice your frustrations with anything. Argue about if you want K-State to go by K-State, Kansas State, whatever on the jerseys. A lot of opportunities. And then keep staying locked in to the YouTube right here so you can get great breakdowns when commits happen from Drew Galloway. You can get the KSO show as always. We do a game preview for each and every basketball game. And uh, then, you know, endless thumbs up for me whenever uh, I'm holding my daughter who was a little cranky this morning. This is the first time she's been so bad when we were recording that I had to pick her up. Uh, I hope not to have to do that again. So uh, that will do it for us. Thank you for watching KSO for Derek Young. I'm Mason Voth. This is Elliot in my arms and uh, we'll be back on Sunday, the Sunday show myself Drew Galloway and KSU underscore fan. We will have a recap and a show after the Nebraska game. So we'll have everything for you there. And then D.Y. and I back next week as we get closer to the Pop-Tarts Bowl and uh, plenty of signing day coverage next week as well. So for K-State Online, we are out of here. We'll see you next time.